Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining the needs assessment and analysis um, session. My name is Brian McDonald. I'm the information management officer for the global CCM cluster on IOM side. And I'll be facilitating uh, today's session alongside uh, Elisa Annenbade, the IMO for the cluster from UNHCR. Uh, before I give an overview of today's session, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First up, we've uh, James McArthur, a Senior GIS and Settlement Specialist and CCM Focal Point for REACH initi Initiative. Uh, Gretchen Berman, the Data Scientist with the Global Displacement Tracking Matrix team from IOM. Mohamed Risky, the Senior DTM Coordination Manager from IOM. Magali Salazar, Lead Analyst of the Project Management Unit of the Joint Intersectoral um, Analysis Group, and Mohamed Kashif, Information Manage Management Officer, also with the Project Management Unit of the GF. In, the, in their most basic form, needs assessment play a key role for all sectors in understanding where the populations in need are, what groups are affected, to who, and what those specific needs are. It's a critical step in informing a response that need, meets needs where they're most severe, and planning of services that are both appropriate and sufficient in scale. It's an area that's seen enormous developments over the past decade with the adoption of tools and methods to effectively gather large amounts of data, data in a timely manner and the, developed of many, the development of many conceptual tools and frameworks that help us piece together those different elements and interlinkages of needs. It's also an area that's continuously evolving as we see increasing adoption of approaches such as remote sensing, mobile phone data, and conceptual frameworks to explore needs in a more cross-sectoral manner, allowing us to examine the co-occurrences of different needs. Managing and coordinating this volume and diversity information poses new challenges of its own. COVID-19 has also presented used, huge challenges in relation to needs assessment not only in how to integrate an understanding of COVID-19 needs and risks into our existing tools, but also how to adapt our approaches to gathering this information on needs in ways that limit, limit contagion risk among vulnerable groups. Today's session will examine some of these topics, starting with three presentations, one from James on vulnerability indices, one from Gretchen on DT, the DTM Partners Toolkit, and one from Magali and Kashif explaining the joint intersectoral analysis framework. Following these presentations, we will split out into three breakout rooms, loosely connected to the three presentations, where you can test out a vulnerability index, discuss challenges and approaches to needs assessment coordination, and to discuss intersectoral needs assessment from a CCM perspective. We really want your active participation in this session, so please add your questions and opinions in the chat during the presentations for further discussion during the breakout rooms. And before we go to the presentations, we would like to start a Mentimeter poll to um, get a better understanding of your need assessment challenges and perspectives from your context. Uh, over to you, Elisa. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Elisa Nambi, as Brian said. I am the counterpart as an IMO from the UNHCR side for the global CCM cluster. And we would like you to have as a start to answer a few questions on the Menti Mentimeter to help us understand a bit who you are, um, basically who are our audiences and what are your perception about needs assessment and CCCM. So you can see at the moment a Mentimeter shared in front of you. Uh, please enter on the menti.com and enter the code 69858219. Thank you. And we'll go to the next slide. So the first question that we are asking you is what is your current role? Are you an information management officer? Um, are you a program project manager for CCCM? Are you monitoring and evaluation officer? Are you account manager or something else that is not related to any of those three options? Um, I can see the results are coming. So we have a lot of other 
we have a lot of IMOs joining a uh, few MNEs, a uh, few CCCM program and project managers and camp managers. Well, that makes it quite an interesting mix. Um, so more or less you're familiar with the needs assessment and CCCM. So the next questions are gonna be quite relevant for you. And the first question for you, have you ever participated in a CCCM data collection exercise or analysis? It could be either or. It could be um, as a camp manager, it could be from an information management perspective in the cluster, or you never ever seen a CCCM data collection exercise. Come on, people, only 30 people voted out of 99. That's not very proactive. 33, okay. Uh, well, as Brian said, this session is massively based on your participation with us. So please feel free to always send us in the chat um, any questions, concerns, and also vote. Um, next question is, which is the most important type of needs assessment? for CCCM. This is the initial one. And when we say initial assessment, it's basically the ones that take three to five days to be done. Um, they're usually analyzing the context. Um, they're quick to go. Is it a rapid assessment? So basically rapid assessments are usually informed by the initial assessments and they're the next stage. Then we have the in-depth assessments that are one-off time assessments that are done quite in depth, so with quite a lot of questions, or is it the monitoring where you're monitoring on a monthly basis, quarterly, et cetera, some sort of um, trend or situation? And I can see that um, many of you voted that the, many of you are basically voting between the initial and rapid. It's jumping quite massively, I can see. So the first one is the initial monitoring rapid, and the last one is in depth. Well, I'm gonna be honest with you all. This was a trick question. None of them are most important. They're all important in an equal manner, depending on the situation that you're in and on your operational context. If it's an onset of an emergency, you would always have an initial assessment to understand where you have access, and what type of rapid assessment you have to do quite quickly. Uh, later on, you will be doing monitoring, and when you need to know something very well, you do an in-depth one-time assessment. So I'm very sorry that we did tricked you with ranking, but we really wanted to see what your thinking is. What do we need to have there? Um, next question is basically your ideas. And it's more or less, we would like to understand more um, why needs assessment and analysis are important for CCCM. You will have two options that you can tell us what you think. Um, it's quite an important question for both me and Brian in terms of understanding the perception why you think needs assessment are important and also to help us from the global level to understand what, more where we should focus and what is the importance for you is. Um, and what level of understanding do you have about needs assessments and analysis? To understand, coordinate, managing camps, respond. Wow, you guys have quite a lot of ideas why it's important. Advocacy. So yeah, so basically we have three main ones that have been pulled up. Oh wow, it's changing. I cannot even say now that there are three main ones. I'll give you a few more seconds, I guess. It helps just to everyone. When we're doing a word cloud like this, it really helps to just put one word in because then it's much more likely to match with other people and your word's more likely to grow and come to the front. So if you put whole sentences in, it's unlikely to match exactly with someone else. The computer's not clever enough to match up your sentence with someone else's if they're not exactly the same. 
Oh, true, but I would also say from what I have been seeing, a lot of people wrote one word too, so. Um, so it's not much of a, but basically from what I'm seeing at the moment and as all of you are seeing, we have the main one has been popping all the time, coordination, advocacy, understanding came up in different words, in gaps and needs analysis, response, evidence, baseline. Um, and all of those are yes, true. They're very important. Um, it's interesting that you're all using a bit different language in that sense. So we all have a common understanding that we call it in a different ways depending on our context and operations. Um, so that's something that is interesting to see and yeah, coordination, advocacy, planning and understanding. Brian, are you taking a note? Good. And the next question is basically on what is the most challenging part in coordinating needs assessment life cycle? And I'm gonna just put first the image that I have here. And this is the basic image that we have in terms of the cycle where you're setting up a coordination, um, when you're planning the assessment, you're doing the data collection, you're doing data processing, joint analysis, et cetera. All of them have different levels. All of them are usually going in a cycle. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out why we say coordinated need assessments, as some of you might know, we have uncoordinated need assessments and coordinated ones. And even the coordinated needs assessments can go into joint need assessments or harmonized. And all of those are different terminologies that could be used in different ways in the operation in terms of what type of need assessment it is. Um, so the question is, what is the most challenging part in coordinating needs assessment lifecycle for you, no matter if you are in CCCM or in another sector? And I'm seeing that setting up coordination, planning, a lot of you are finding that planning and data processing and basic analysis seems to be the most difficult part and the review. Well, we're still losing a bit. Okay. So I can see that more or less everyone voted about data processing and basic analysis. So basically the start of the analysis Many of you said it's a review, um, design of data collection and setting up coordination. We're more or less on the same level on all of them, except one that this shows to be lower, but now it's a bit moved, which was joint analysis part. Um, I personally, and that's my personal feeling about from working from the field, um, joint analysis might be the most complicated one for myself. Um, planning, doing data collection, um, designing the data collection, doing the basic analysis. I don't find it as tricky as doing joint analysis and the final review stage where we need to pull out the lessons learned that will affect us our next stage steps. And that's kind of a very challenging step that we usually forget to do or try to avoid it or quite skim it. Uh, while well, we say, yeah, we, yeah, this is what happens, but okay, fine. Um, we don't really move those lessons learned later on in the review stage. And today's session, um, some of those points will be covered by our colleagues from DTM, OCHA, and REACH. So you will see different levels of those and you can ask questions in terms of how they're uh, mitigating those challenges in their assessments. And the last question to you is, what are your current or past challenges with CCCM needs assessments. So it's more to capture what do you find challenges as a CCCM practitioner with needs assessments. And I don't see any responses. Is my mentee working correctly?
And why we are asking this question also is um, we would like both me and Brian to take note of those challenges and try to find a solution for them for you in the next couple of months. I'm not promising that it's going to happen in the next month exactly, but we'll do our best till the end of the year um, to try to address some of those challenges. And I do think some of the speakers today might be also talking to you about some of those challenges too, or explaining to you how they're going through them. So some people wrote joint analysis, stretch time to finalize assessments, ensuring adaptation of response based on analysis, be rapid in data collection analysis. To agree, do it in time and still keep it relevant. I think that's quite an important one, always to have the assessments relevant, but how do we do that for CCCM, right? Poor understandings of standards and indicators. For CCCM, that's kind of quite an important part. We are very much intersectoral cluster. We usually have indicators from other clusters that we use in our assessments. And it's always a thin line between how do we collect the basic information to understand gaps and needs without overstepping on the other sectors. Um, because we're somehow a mini coordination data collection sector. People, availability of tools and funds. Well, you have inserted quite a lot of different challenges that you find for CCCM. I guess we'll try our best to cluster them in and try to respond to some of them in the next couple of months. And please don't be shy to ask some of those challenges in terms of CCCM to our speakers in the next sessions, especially in the breakout room sessions. And I will give this floor now to my colleague from REACH, to James, um, to continue and to start with his part of explaining about vulnerability indices. Over to you, James. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you, Brian. Let me just share my screen here and bring up my presentation. Yeah, thank you for, for having me um, and reach here to present on this day of, of the topic of people-centered CCCM and the importance of, of needs assessments and analysis in CCM settings. Uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, an information management and assessment analysis uh, topic in, in, in this year's agenda, um, and it's exciting to, to be here. I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about first um, the, the different types of needs assessments briefly and, and transitioning into then um, not only assessment but analysis, and then starting to, to scratch the surface a bit on, on vulnerability, uh, vulnerability index uh, as piloted in Iraq. I won't go into depth here because I think you know Brian and Alyssa already articulated well why we need um, needs assessments um, that we you know we must listen and understand to the the needs of the affected population to improve the quality of assistance. Um, also, the you know the grand bargain signatories require needs assessments that are impartial, unbiased, comprehensive, context sensitive, timely, and up to date. And I think it's really difficult to have one assessment that satisfies this um, with dynamic situations of displacement and access. And so I think that there, there really is a, a wide range of, of different types of needs assessments as Alyssa started to, to touch on the different phases, but also it's depending on the different typologies, um, also the different statistical representation of the assessment. And what does that mean? Um, the different information gaps and research objectives that we want to to answer some of the questions that were you know coming in from colleagues you know time to do uh, a more detailed or in-depth uh, assessment uh, so how do we explore some of those other research objectives and information gaps um, different access methodologies available um, different frequencies of information needs um, you know how much time do we have what's good enough uh, for the response um, there's different CCM partner capacities 
And we also have to understand what, what can we accomplish in, in one assessment, given the assessment length and, and assessment fatigue. And I think that all plays into to many different factors of why there are so much, such a wide range of, of different needs assessments. And here you all be you'll, you'll be familiar with this graphic here about uh, displaced popula populations and their typologies. And and I think this is a good di uh, a good diagram to 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 show that there's needs assessments tailored for different typologies and geographies. So. Um, whether we're talking about IDPs in dispersed settings or outside of camps or in self-settled informal settlements in urban or peri-urban contexts, uh, perhaps uh, the best needs assessment approach is through an area-based assessment uh, to understand that specific subpopulation group in that specific geography. Um, or perhaps that could be a needs assessment that's more tailored to a planned camp um, uh, and having an individual camp profile for that, uh, that site. Uh, in, or for other sites, um, individual profiles for collective centers or transit reception centers or other large camp-like self-settled informal settlements that also require a similar in-depth uh, profile. Or in some country missions, it could be the case where there's hundreds if not thousands of informal sites and collective centers and that actually we need uh, uh, district profiles across several districts, uh, geographical areas to capture uh, the differences across the numerous types of informal settlements. And so here you can already start to see that this will start to form the basis of the needs assessment. What is the typology and geography that we're trying to, uh, to tackle here? And before going into some of the, some of the core needs assessments um, and the different information gaps and research objectives, I'd like just to say that a core component, I think, in that initial rapid ass that initial assessment is, is site identification, um, because the site identification as assessment is is really ensuring that you know we leave no one behind and that we ensure inclusiveness of all camps and in, in, in self-settled informal sites into the geography of the needs assessment, um, because if we don't uh, if we aren't comprehensive in this component and we're not uh, uh, continuing uh, to monitor this, it could lead to uh, a lack of inclusion in the needs assessment and, and thus most likely a lack of inclusion into the humanitarian response. And so I think that's something that's important to note before even starting to get into uh, needs assessments. But for, for, for reach supporting the CCCM uh, sector, there's different information gaps and research objectives. So a camp and site profiling, here, we're really trying to make sure that the emphasis is on camp and camp-like context indicators. So for example, when we're talking about you know, general um, indicators, uh, for example, from protection, it could be asking about documentation. Well, that's applicable to returnees, that's applicable to vulnerable groups in the host community, that's applicable to IDPs uh, renting apartments, as well as IDPs in, in camps. But perhaps protection indicators that are more relevant to that camp or communal setting where we're looking at, you know, do the communal latrines or bathing facilities have uh, functional locking mechanisms or lighting? Um, these are more oriented indicators to camp-like settings that we try to tackle in, in camp and site profiling, as well as obviously a heavier CCCM sectoral focus uh, as well. Then there's service infrastructure needs. I think this is also important that through direct observation uh, of infrastructure service, we can see what is there and what isn't present, what is missing, what is functioning, what needs repair. And I think that's also important um, to, to investigate from a, a direct observational standpoint of the infrastructure needs of a site uh, and starting to look at that, how that lines up to, to the standards uh, and camp planning and SARE standards. And then information needs for returns and durable solutions. Um, so barriers to return, the needs of area, of, the needs in the area of origin or the perception of the area of origin. So understanding these information needs to, uh, to inform returns and durable solutions, uh, I think is also uh, an important core uh, part. And then lastly, displacement monitoring and rapid needs, um, understanding where IDPs are going in a dynamic situation, how many there are, but also the, the top priority needs that are most uh, urgent in those first uh, you know, 72 hours of, of a response, uh, for example. 
And each of these assessments have different objectives and they have different information gaps and they serve a different purpose. There's a very wide diverse um, portfolio of, of needs assessments uh, as, as some examples. And this list can, can go on um, and there's a, a long diverse list of, of assessments. So area-based assessments, for example, um, in Burkina Faso um, or hazard exposure assessments, understanding you know, which, from what, what is needed for, for preparedness, what is needed for contingency plans, what is needed for mitigation. Um, how do we understand the, the exposure of sites or shelters to different hazards? Um, intersectoral needs assessments, right? Bringing in that connectivity, clean energy and sustainability lens, right? Um, how do we understand these intersectoral concerns uh, in CCM contexts? Uh, you know, as well as the national, you know, MSNAs in many CCM cluster uh, countries, and how does the MSNA, uh, which includes camp and informal site uh, populations, uh, in the same in the same geography? But oh, let's talk more about some of the more interesting components of analysis, um, and really moving from assessment to analysis. And, and, and here, I think we, we get caught sometimes, many of us in the IM field, um, of, of doing assessments that we're just spitting out responses. Um, you have a questionnaire, and what is the response of that question? Here it is. But that's not analysis, right? That's just showing the response of the questionnaire. Um, really moving towards analysis, we're, we're, we're trying to digest those responses and make sense of the responses. So what does this mean against known camp management standards or sectoral sphere standards, right? Can we actually start to benchmark these achievements and these targets that we're trying to achieve? Um, and then if this is something that's on a one-time information uh, product or needs assessment, we can start looking at trends analysis. So if this is something that's happening bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly, biannually, annually, well, we can start looking at, has the situation improved or worsened? Is it staying uh, stagnant in one area? And if so, which area? And we can actually start to see where the situation specifically is, is improving, improving or, or, or not um, for these specific uh, um, indicators. And then comparative analysis. So not looking at necessarily how the, a specific camp is doing in terms of these standards or how is it's improving or not, but what about across 50 camps, right? How does that camp compare to other camps across the same indicators? And I think this is very interesting uh, comparative analysis to do as well. And I think can really um, highlight uh, some, some, some interesting areas that perhaps would have been missed in simply just responding the responses um, of the assessment. And these are some interesting components of, of the in-depth analysis. And lastly, which I would like to speak more about today in this PowerPoint, but also continue on in further discussion and in, the, in the next groups, is about a vulnerability index and vulnerability analysis. Uh, I'll start with a case example from Iraq. So why a vulnerability index? Why is this an interesting analysis? Um, uh, I think that this really helps assist in monitoring the situation in sites, particularly uh, and especially in informal sites, self-settled settlements, um, and being able to flag perhaps vulnerable geographical areas of concern, or perhaps flagging specific vulnerability components of concern. So maybe there's not really a, a geographical distribution of concern, but maybe there's a specific concern in a certain component of vulnerability or vice versa. Um, and I think that's something that you can really identify and pinpoint through a vulnerability index. The red flag index, as it used to be called in Iraq, it's not necessarily new, it's been revised um, and, and piloted again in, in this, uh, the most recent uh, informal sites assessment with the CCM cluster. And here's just an, an example. Um, from, from Iraq where they included 24 indicators, vulnerability indicators. And, and we can see that uh, the level of analysis that they've conducted on is at the, at the um, uh, district level. And, and they're looking at uh, here, you can see Dohuk is, is, informal sites in Dohuk are, are slightly more vulnerable 
in terms of the indicators than in Airbio, and you can compare side by side, you know, where are those specific differences uh, across those vulnerability indicators between Dahook and Airbio and formal sites. Um, or if the sampling and representation allows, you know, to even start looking at the site level, uh, which sites are actually more vulnerable than others, um, given the 24 indicators that we've looked at. I think this is really uh, an interesting analysis, and I hope to get more feedback on this because this is something that's just being uh, presented um, currently, and we look for, for partner feedback uh, on its usefulness. But I know that vulnerability, it can be, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical jargon, a lot of uh, different words in this sphere, and it can be a little, uh, maybe a little intimidating or a little confusing uh, when we start talking about susceptibility and vulnerability or vulnerability and capacity or exposure and vulnerability or exposure and risk preparedness capacity, adaptive capacity, and coping capacity. So there's a lot of buzzwords, but what do they mean and how, they're, how are they different uh, exactly? I think is something that's it's obviously important to, to understand uh, when talking about doing a vulnerability index. And so there's three core components of vulnerability, regardless of to what, okay? So uh, the to what is important later on when you're developing indicators. Okay, so the indicators that you select and choose um, and how they're worded is important to, to the what. But regardless of that, there are three core components of what vulnerability is. And that's susceptibility, uh, so the likelihood of suffering harm, uh, coping capacity, uh, the ability uh, or the capacity to reduce negative consequences, and then the adaptive capacity, the capacities for longer term strategies and societal change. And these three components interact with each other to make up uh, vulnerability. And how do you calculate that now is, is, is even a more trickier question. Um, uh, for, the, for the IMs, you know, which of these equations is, is correct in terms of calculating vulnerability? If you had these indicators uh, developed, how would you actually come to a conclusion on, on vulnerability? And this is something that we'll explore in the breakout session and, and getting into some more of the technical details. So please, please join me and happy to, to discuss these uh, technical components in, in further details. And then when we talk about site vulnerability to what, um, this is the part of the research objective that will, face, that will form the basis of the indicator selection. So we're talking about site vulnerability to COVID-19. That was a big thing in the last year. A lot of the CCM clusters were we're, we're examining site vulnerability to COVID-19, uh, site vulnerability to flooding, uh, very relevant in many of the CCM responses, uh, site vulnerability to cholera, fires, or just in general, a CCCM site vulnerability from a CCCM perspective. Um, so I think it's, it's obviously important to identify the vulnerability to what, which will form the indicators, but the core components of the vulnerability doesn't really change. Um, and, and something that's also interesting to explore now with the launch of the, the new camp management minimum standards is can these camp management minimum standards be translated into a CCCM site vulnerability index, right? Can we extract indicators about site management action plans and apply that to understanding coping capacity or the percent of site management staff who have completed adequate training to site susceptibility or the percent of site population who report uh, site government, governance is uh, structures are inclusive, effective in reaching all of the displaced population into site adaptive capacity. So can we actually extract these now, these indicators uh, from the minimum standards and start to formulate it into these components of coping capacity, site susceptibility and site adaptive capacity to understand a bit more of the, the, the vulnerability across SS sites. I think that's something interesting to explore. And again, I, I look forward to, to exploring more of these topics on, on the vulnerability index um, in the breakout session. Uh, so look forward to, look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, Melissa. Thank you, James. Uh, that's really interesting. I, I like how you highlighted uh, how well, we've, we all use these same words, but perhaps a very different uh, understandings in, in how we apply them. 
and uh, thanks for also linking to the camp management standards. Uh, our second presentation is uh, from Gretchen from the DTM uh, team presenting on the DTM Partners Toolkit. Uh, Gretchen, are, are you there? Hi there, yep, just trying to share my screen. Not sure if you can see it. Can you hear me? Yeah, we see a screen with some, uh, with it says CCM and DTM and some messages. It's a kind of a white screen. Yeah, Ricky is going to start and then we'll yes. take it. Yeah, thanks, Gretchen. Maybe I'll just start quickly to give a bit of uh, context um, on what is going to be presented from the DTM side. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Mohamed Rizki. I'm, uh, I'm uh, managing our global support team here in, uh, in Geneva. Um, I'll let Gretchen introduce herself because she's going to present the, the more important part of the presentation. Um, but just to set the context quickly, uh, I tried just before the, just today, I tried to find uh, the oldest online available reference to, um, to DTM and CCCM, and I stumbled upon this uh, exchange from 2009 during Cauchy flood response, where the DTM was implemented inside the CCCM. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a CCCM mechanism to collect multi-sectoral data for the uh management of cam as well as the coordination of the of of the cluster itself um just to say that um cccm has always been the place where dtm grew up and will always be you know the place where uh the dtm will come back uh, we have expanded uh, significantly into you know different programming areas but but i think the core the core of the of the DTM uh, activities are still with the uh, CCCM. This explains now um, um, what Gretchen will be presenting shortly. Uh, it's called the DTM and Partners Initiative. Uh, it is started in follow up to the work commission under the Grand Bargain Workstream Five on improving needs assessment. Uh, specifically on the objective of uh, uh, better use, maximizing the use of, uh, of data in humanitarian response. Um, the idea here is that uh, we collectively are collecting uh, more and more data, more and more volume of data being collected every day. Well, at the same time, it's not every time that all these data parts uh, uh, being used or even even useful uh, uh, for the response. So the effort is really to try to bring um, discussions with all the global clusters, including and especially CCCM, to try to hash out those um, indicators again, uh, multi-sectoral information that we collect. Because um, um, uh, to, to try to find the right balance between the amount of data that we collect and the analysis we are able to produce and the use of the, the, those analysis in, in, in our work. So this is where then we start uh, um, you know, having different discussion with different clusters, uh, global clusters, as well as uh, with country operations. Um, to try to, um, first of all, to try to uh, create better uh, understanding of what we collect and what we analyze. Um, second of all is to try to make the data be user friendly, easier to use um, uh, with guidance on how to use them. Um, all in all is, is really to try to improve the use of, of the DTM data. And in this case of uh, of uh, CAM coordination and CAM management cluster, I think it's very relevant because um, the the core business of the CCCM itself, right, it's to coordinate uh, provision of uh, delivery of services in, in uh, for IDPs in camps. Um, so it touch upon all different sector needs uh, and gaps. So as we improve 
uh, on the side of sectoral analysis, we will, we will also improve uh, in terms of how CCCM could benefit from from the from those um, uh, work. Um, I guess I'm gonna stop there because there is only 15 minutes, and I hope I don't I haven't used much of the time. Gretchen, I'm going to pass over to you. And then after the presentation, I think we'll also have a breakout session where we can go into a bit more details and have a bit of discussion over from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Rizki. Uh, thanks, Rizki, for that excellent summary. I think, um, as he mentioned, um, I'm going to give a brief sort of high level overview, and then there may be some things that come up in either in the questions in the chat or um, that we can go into in a bit more detail during the breakout session. So just uh, as an overview of what we sort of hope to accomplish in our remaining time, um, I want to sort of leave you with a better understanding of how DTM deploys different components and different mechanisms for data collection and analysis to sort of help our partners better understand how they can use the data. Um, and then sort of help you better understand the structure for cooperation between DTM, CCCM, and all our other partners. Um, and then also, I just want to showcase a few practical tools for using DTM data for your work. Um, and then, like I said, Rizki will lead the breakout session for tools that can help you with DTM and maybe lead a broader discussion about some um, applications or questions that you might have. So just at a glance here, um, I'll give you a brief overview of DTM, and then we'll talk a little bit about foundations of cooperation between DTM and partners. And I'll show you both the DTM field companion and a tool for settlement typologies that um, we've developed. And then any questions you have, like Brian said, you can just put them in the chat and Rizki and I will be monitoring and we can address them um, during the breakout session. So who are DTM partners? DTM partners are any organization, agency or institution or group that can use DTM data for humanitarian response. And so the CCCM cluster is a strategic partner for DTM because we really work to collect data for everyone and that includes CCCM very specifically. Um, just as an overview, DTM at a glance, um, there are sort of four major components for DTM and it's sort of really essential to understand these a bit better because they help guide sort of practical applications of data collection um, so, for example, where we're collecting, how often we're collecting data. Um, for example, we have mobility tracking that includes all of the multi-sectoral location assessments. So that might be through key informants and with enumerators. Um, so that's the sources. Um, we have flow monitoring and that's a sort of different um, flow rather than sort of stationary um, data collection with true surveys. We, we sometimes do registration. So for example, through partner uh, WFP um, and then very specific surveys where we're taking a subset of a specific population of interest and doing a survey. And so one of the things that we just wanted to highlight here is that DTM is sort of, it's not a monolith in terms of data collection. We have a very sort of dynamic um, data collection mechanism and it varies very dramatically by country. And so it's important for partners to understand that if you're looking to use DTM data for a specific country, that getting to know data collection mechanisms in that country is really essential because each country does it sort of in their own way um, and using different elements of DTM components. Another thing that I really wanted to highlight is that um, DTM works really hard to publicly share most of our data. And so on the DTM website, I've highlighted in a little circle here, but um, you can access all of the data sets um, for each of the countries, and that includes um, baseline assessments, location assessments, um, things like that. And so one of the discussions that we have frequently with our partners, and one of the things that the DTM and Partners Toolkit really works to accomplish is to sort of highlight relevant data. Um, so in this case, highlight relevant CCCM data and how available and accessible it is either through our website or on HDX and things like that. Um, so I just wanted to briefly point that out. Um, and so one of the things that has come up a lot as we've sort of worked on this 
BTM and Partners Toolkit and as data collection activities expand in many different countries is that we've worked together with a lot of organizations and partners, including PCCM, to understand sort of common challenges to needs assessments. And uh, one of the things is that we worked on the Grand Bargain Group on Workstream on Needs Assessments to identify sort of core challenges and subsequently a shared series of solutions um, to cooperation with partners when it comes to data collection. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the basic foundations for cooperation that we've come up with um, that we have globally agreed upon with partners um, to better facilitate cooperation when it comes to both our data collection and then appropriate use of BTM data. And so I, I won't get too into these. Um, if you have specific questions about them, we can discuss in the breakout sessions, but I'll just run through them briefly. Um, so the first one is a common process. And so that's an agreed upon process based on sort of best practices that allows DTM to know exactly which steps to go through without missing sort of any critical junctures, specifically as we communicate and talk to partners. Um, very similar to other processes used by um, other clusters and IMs. Um, and so the second uh, foundation for cooperation is this idea of walking backwards. And so that means that we make all of our sort of, all of these steps come from information needs and understanding information needs and decisions that need to be made. So country capacities, um, information gaps, things like that. And then we work backwards towards methodology and then questions and mechanisms. And so that's sort of the best way that we can keep everything running as efficiently as possible and not sort of over collect data where we don't need to or miss any critical sort of data, data gaps. And the other thing that's really important here is the clear roles and responsibilities. So, um, you know, between CCCM and uh, DTM and other partners, we have different roles. So here, DTM is a data provider. CCCM uses DTM data very heavily. And so it's sort of, it's important for us to establish those roles and then also agree to sort of bilaterally communicate with each other about information needs, gaps, and things like that. And so, you know, it's the role of our partners to communicate with us the DTM information that we need, and it's our role to communicate what information we're able to obtain and how, how we can proceed with that. The other thing that I wanted to point out is the shared responsibility. Um, so we rely really heavily on our partners to help us understand um, information needs because a lot of the DTM data that we produce is used heavily by the entire humanitarian community. And so it's really important for partners to help us develop processes and methods that will provide everyone with the most efficient data possible. And that includes both filling information gaps, but that also includes, you know, making sure that we don't have major redundancies where, for example, somebody else is collecting the same data. Um, the next one is appropriate methods and sources. Um, so this just has more to do with a sort of global agreement on making sure that you know, for example, if we are sending enumerators to collect information on the safety of women, that we're not using male enumerators in that situation and other sort of mismatches of data collection methods and data collection practices with the information that we need to collect. And then the last one here is complementary data use. So what we mean by this is basically just that DTM is never going to be able to collect all of the data. And what we hope to do most efficiently and in the best way is to collect data that can be used complementary with other types of data. Um, so for example, focus group discussions or other types of household surveys in a way that can be put together for the best possible use of analysis. So we want to contribute to the best possible explanatory analysis and interpretation. And that means that our partners um, can put together DTM data with other types of data in order to produce more robust results. So now I just want to give you two examples briefly of um, tools that we've developed with partners to better facilitate the use of DTM data. Um, I know Brian, I know I have, I'm running out of time a bit, but I just wanted to briefly highlight these. 
Um, so one is the field companion, which is basically a tool that includes suggestions for how to best use DTM data. Um, so that includes sort of what information needs um, questions contribute to suggested use of results, even sort of like how to visualize certain types of things, um, sort of sensitivity issues, um, how information should be shared. Um, the field companion comes with a DTM, sorry, excuse me, a do no harm checklist um, for minimizing risk when developing questions. Um, and then it has sectoral guidance for modifying and using um, sort of each of these questions. So I would encourage you all to look at that. I think um, after one of the things that's nice about the field companion is after information needs are identified, we can select relevant questions from the field companion, which fulfill those information needs. And it's sort of a nice sort of set of guardrails to understand sort of what's established methodologically already and what might need to continue to be worked on in the future. Um, so this is just a brief example of the field companion for CCCM. Um, as you can see, there's sort of the examples of visualizations. There's an example of descriptive analysis. It really provides a sort of robust framework for understanding um, what, what's available and how to best use sort of the information that's already out there. Um, and DTM and CCCM colleagues work together um, on, the, on the field companion. And so if there are already sort of suggested questions, it's one of those things that is, is sort of a living, living tool um, that allows us to sort of add things and, and remove things as they become more or less relevant. The last tool that I wanted to highlight before I, before I turn it back over to, to you, Brian, is um, this settlement typology tool. Um, we work together uh, with UNHCR and IOM Global CCCM colleagues on this. And it's basically sort of a matching tool that helps working groups and clusters and um, DTM colleagues in countries identify what specific settlement types are used in country by clusters and working groups and how they link to sort of the global set of settlement types. Um, so it's sort of a, a way to match sort of any sort of discrepancies in terminology at the country level with sort of global level terminology. Um, and this is just an effort to sort of keep the link from a data perspective so that we can have more cohesive analysis across, across countries and even across sectors, even when we have sort of these in-country um, discrepancies. Um, and so I just wanted to demonstrate sort of that we have, in addition to sort of these more sort of conceptual ideas about cooperation with partners and making DTM, more, DTM data more useful, we also have a few practical tools um, and Rizki will also talk more about the more of the practical tools that are available in the DTM and partners toolkit. So just in closing, I also want to add that one of the things is that we aspire to continue to add tools to this um, and to make it more useful. And so we would encourage you to keep those lines of communication open. And so if you have ideas or suggestions about tools that can be developed, um, you can always contact us. Um, Daunia, who couldn't be here today, is one of our um, leads on the DTM and Partners Toolkit, and so she had asked to include her contact information here, and you should feel, feel free to, uh, to take advantage of that. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, Brian, I'll turn it back over to you, and if you have questions, again, please feel free to write them in the chat. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gretchen. Um, yeah, I, I really like the, that the DTM Partner Toolkit. It's not trying to reinvent a wheel. It really does take um, a lot of existing best practices and uh, examples uh, and approaches that have uh, been proven to work in the field. It's, it's really great. Um, next uh, final presentation is by uh, Magali from the uh, PMU unit of the Joint Interagency Analysis Framework. Uh, hi, Magali. Um, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Brian. Thank you for the introduction. Let me uh, start the presentation and share my screen. All right. Can you confirm, Brian, that uh, you can see the presentation? Yeah, it's, yeah, there we go. It's maximized now. Thanks. Excellent. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Magali Salazar, and I am the analyst for the GF Interagency Project Management Unit. 
Um, and this uh, session will focus on the joint intersectoral analysis framework. And I'll get to, uh, to the details in a second. Um, as a reminder, the GF was developed through a highly consultative process uh, led by a multi-agency technical body um, comprising of specialists from UN agencies, uh, global clusters, including first and foremost, the CCCM cluster. Thank you, Brian and uh, Lisa. Um, but also uh, from specialized uh, organizations like our colleagues uh, from REACH, uh, as well as ACAPS, um, other NGOs have contributed, uh, academia, private sector, uh, and other related needs analysis uh, stakeholders, such as the IPC, for instance. So um, it's a highly consultative process. And maybe the, the key uh, message to remember here is that every single piece of guidance, every sentence has been highly negotiated. Um, and uh, the, what I'm going to, to present is also the fruit from uh, that, um, let's say, negotiation. Um, maybe um, in terms of the, the session plan for today, uh, just three points uh, to keep it simple. A quick introduction to the GIF. Uh, Brian mentioned uh, that this was quite a diverse group. And I, when I looked at the participants, uh, more than uh, 80 of you, I, I do know some of you from previous lives. Uh, but indeed, um, I'm not sure that everyone is familiar with the GF, so we'll have just a quick intro. Uh, the recent developments, I have some good news here. And finally, uh, the resources that you can uh, access, uh, either in terms of um, uh, pre-recorded uh, trainings or uh, live help desk support that you can have on the, on the agenda. Um, so as a reminder, the, the GIF is part of the HPC suite in the sense that uh, the, the GIF is the approach that underpins the HNO. It's the joint intersectoral analysis uh, that is um, yielding the results that are being used in the humanitarian needs of the few um, document. The HNO, however, is bigger than the GF in the sense that there are some elements that are included in that document that are not coming from the, the GF analysis. For instance, the, the sector pages or um, some uh, capacity uh, assessments, et cetera, et cetera. So the GF is not the synonym of the HNO. The, H, the GF feeds into the HNO, but the G HNO is bigger. Than, uh, than the, the GF. The GF is actually an approach, uh, an approach that is composed of three elements. First, a concept, uh, which is a joint intersectoral analysis rather than multi-sectoral. Uh, and I was quite, uh, quite pleased to hear uh, James uh, talk about this a bit earlier in, uh, in the discussion. Um, and it focuses on the people who are affected by the crisis in the sense that you start from their standpoint rather than from geographical areas or uh, from um, uh, sectoral perspectives. So the idea is to identify the population groups and uh, to uh, use a framework that will allow you to structure the analysis uh, uh, to identify what are the intersectoral needs uh, that these groups are facing. So I already started talking about the methodology here. Uh, so the, the, the GF is composed of three elements um, methodologically, and I'll, I'll show you another slide on this, but um, it, it gives you the structure uh, on how to classify the information um, Jeff, James mentioned uh, a bit earlier the, the difference between assessment and analysis, and, and here we're squarely in the analysis uh, bit. The, the GF does not uh, collect uh, data, does not 
do assessment or primary data collection, the Vijay app uses pre-existing uh, data. Uh, even if it was collected for the purpose of, uh, of a GIAF, such as is the case for uh, multi-sectoral needs assessments uh, or MSMAs in some cases uh, conducted by REACH in some countries, or the DTM, um, the GIAF is the analytical framework uh, methodology and process that allows you to jointly analyze this information. The process itself is, uh, to be honest, quite standard. Um, the idea is to uh, set up a team, propose a plan uh, that adapts the standard methodology to country-specific reality. Um, once you've agreed on your plan, collect the data, organize it as per the plan, um, and uh, then consolidate the information, analyze it jointly, and validate the results. So if said like this, the GF sounds like it's quite straightforward, uh, but of course it is um, uh, a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, whoa. Sorry, uh, that was a pre-recorded uh, slide and uh, I just need to cut the audio. Sorry for that glitch here. I have another one. Oh. Apologies for uh, the interruption. Um, so I mentioned just a little bit earlier that the, the GF was composed of three elements uh, methodologically. Um, first, the framework. Uh, which uh, looks at um, five pillars, even though I mean, we call them pillars, even though they're horizontal. The first one is the context. Um, and the context is subdivided into nine areas, political, economy, social, cultural, legal and policy, technological, demography, environment, security and infrastructure. Um, once you've uh, looked at the context, you're going to start zooming in on the people living in the affected area um, and uh, the events and shocks that they're facing. Then uh, on the uh, people who are affected, meaning the impact uh, that uh, those uh, events and shocks have had on uh, the people living in the area, and finally, the humanitarian conditions um, that can be categorized into actually three humanitarian consequences, um, living standards, coping mechanism, physical and mental well-being. Um, the second element is the use of a severity scale and indicators that are um, structured in a way that uh, can provide uh, thresholds for uh, severity classes. And those indicators are nested into the framework and more specifically for the vast majority of them in the humanitarian conditions pillar. Finally, those indicators are uh, then aggregated to provide an overview of the number of people in need uh, per severity class, uh, per area, per population group. Um, this is true in one of the aggregation methodologies that uh, we have provided, which we called scenario A. Um, and another methodology provides a slightly less um, uh, disaggregated um, output. I won't get into the nitty gritty of the details here, um, but maybe the, the key elements to remember is that there are three components in the methodology the framework uh, that allows you to structure uh, how the information is going to be uh, processed, then indicators that allow you to measure and um, uh, organize in uh, severity classes, and then finally, a, uh, a computation and aggregation methodology that allows you to put everything together um, and uh, obtain a uh, an intersectoral pin. Um, 
I've already mentioned a little bit the framework. Um, perhaps uh, let me go uh, ahead and um, oh, focus on, sorry about that. And focus on the, the actual indicators. Um, there is 123 indicators that feed into the, the GF, um, of which uh, six are coming from the CCCM cluster. Uh, most of them are in uh, the living standards, and one of them is actually in, in the, the impact. So this is just a screenshot showing you the, the six uh, CCCM uh, uh, indicators that feed into the, the GF, including um, uh, how they're um, uh, organized. So this is the, the metadata. Um, maybe a few words on what has been happening uh, in the last few weeks. Um, we are actually delighted and a big thank you to uh, my colleagues here, uh, Brian and, um, and Elisa, uh, as well as Gretchen and Risky. Uh, for uh, uh, <laughs> enabling the GF uh, to deliver what we call the GF 1.1. Uh, it's a uh, slightly lighter, more condensed update of uh, last year's uh, guidance. No major methodological change, but some adjustments, uh, mostly update of indicators and uh, additional guidance on the use of critical indicators. There is also new information available on uh, the uh, inclusion and participation of local actors in the GF process. Um, more information on how to identify a GIF data scenario, uh, how to better link intersectoral and sectoral PIM, which I think is uh, something that you might be interested to discuss a little bit later in the breakout group. Um, and finally, uh, the guidance on analyzing risks and determining the most likely evolution of a humanitarian situation um, was released. Uh, and so that's fully included into the, the GF guidance. To try to make life easier for uh, teams in the country, we've also worked on a few companion tools, uh, which are um, templates and um, you know, notes that could be used to support the inception of a GF in country. Uh, or uh, document the selection of indicators and information gaps, and a few um, more maybe IM-oriented tools on uh, the information of the aggregation in scenario A and scenario B. On top of those new updates, um, I just wanted to let you know, in case you're in an HPC country, uh, and you're facing some difficulties with the implementation of the GF, um, you have the possibility to reach out to the help desk, which is uh, an interagency support group uh, that has been set up. It's a subgroup of the GF uh, itself. Uh, and uh, the objective is for field practitioners to raise questions obtain clarification and expert advice in a consolidated um, uh, way, uh, meaning that you uh, will be able to receive a, um, a global clusters slash uh, OCHA agreed upon uh, answer uh, to, to your query. The email uh, that you can send your query to is uh, GF helpdesk at gmail.com. Finally, there are some uh, material available that you can already um, review uh, and um, uh, explore to get more information on the GF and uh, its concept, methodology, and process. There are four high-level pre-recorded presentations that are already available. Uh, and there are eight more in-depth uh, presentations that will be made available in just um, a, a couple of weeks on uh, yeah, more, uh, more in-depth uh, elements of, of a GF, including 
um, aggregation and uh, build pin calculations. I'll leave it here, uh, Brian. Um, I'm sure there are some questions, but maybe we can address them in the breakout room. Over to you. Thanks very much, Magali. Yeah, there's a, a few questions coming in there and uh, we can chat about that in breakout room three. Uh, for this next part, uh, we're going to uh, split into three breakout rooms and you can choose the breakout room of your choice um, and we will um, stay in those rooms for 15 minutes. Breakout room one will be with James and that'll be examining vulnerability in this case. Uh, breakout room two is with uh, Risky, discussing challenges of coordination of assessments. Uh, breakout room three is with Magali uh, discussing intersectoral analysis. Um, so if Alistair can, can help us out and if people down, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see four little squares together uh, with the label breakout rooms. Uh, if you click on that, uh, you should be able to select the room that you want to join. I think worth noting, uh, Brian, that you need to go to the blue um, numbers in order to join. Right. Thanks, Juan. Yeah, and I can see people joining already. Uh, risky. I'm not sure how I can join the. Just some more questions coming in the chat about how do I join. So if you didn't catch what Brian said, if you if you go to the bottom of your screen in the Zoom screen, you'll see either something that says breakout rooms and it'll have a, a symbol with four gray squares. Or if you haven't got that, you might need to click on more and then that will show you that symbol with breakout rooms and four squares. And then when you click on that, you'll see a list of the three breakout rooms with all the participants in. And to the right hand side of that list, there's a number. It will be in blue text. If you click on that blue number, it'll give you the option to join. And then you click join and you should make your way to the room. So just to recap, go to breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see breakout rooms, try clicking on more to open breakout rooms. And then when you get to the breakout rooms list, um, look for the blue number. Uh, there are three of them, so don't just join the first one, choose the one you want to and click on the blue number and then select join. If you're one of the 30 or so people who are still here in the main room, um, and you want to join a breakout room, just let us know, message us or say something, write in the chat, whichever you want to do. Um, if you're one of the 30 people in the main room and you don't want to join a breakout room, that's okay too. Um, but uh, if you do want to join, just if you need some help, just let us know and we'll try to help you out. And just for Alistair, I think I'm gonna stop the recording while the breakout rooms are on. So just a reminder to folk, if you're in the main room, um, if you didn't hear before, uh, everyone's gone to one of three breakout rooms and it's up to you to choose which one of the breakout rooms you want to go to. So to do that, you select breakout rooms, which is a symbol at the bottom of your screen. If you're on your Zoom screen, um, it's sometimes maybe at the top if you've got that floating, but it, it says breakout rooms and it's got four gray squares. When you click on that, it'll open a new box 
and it will show the breakout rooms and the participants. Next to the name of the breakout room, there's a blue number. If you click on the blue number or hover over it, it will allow you to join that breakout room. So if you do want to join one of the breakout rooms, that's how you do it. If you're not sure you're having difficulty with that, just let us know and we can try to help you. Alistair, you see the, the chat from uh, Gideon there. I'm happy to be added to any of the rooms, but not able to do it um, themselves. Yeah. So if you're able to add them, that'd be great. Just sent him off. Thank you. If anyone else wants to be sent to a room, just, just let me know. No, I'm staying here, uh, Alistair, if this is okay. I will just do a couple of other things I'm in the office while the, the sessions are over. No problem there. Well, so just uh, Mohammed also put something in the chat to say that um, he'd like to join one of the rooms. If you're able to help him with that, that'd be great. Uh, actually, I couldn't see that uh, four doors or breakout rooms, but then now I updated my Zoom. I was using old version. So maybe uh, there are other people, they are also using old version of Zoom and they can't see anything like that. Thanks, Kashif. That's really helpful to know. Yeah, we should perhaps send a message to everyone. I'll, I'll do that at the end of the day. I'll remind people that it's useful to update their Zoom because otherwise they may not be able to join meeting rooms. Thank you for that. It's really helpful. Looks like we've got a good number in each of the groups. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's quite even, which is very good.
I'm not sure who just closed those rooms and it shouldn't have happened. Did that end early or, or? Yes. Yeah, something, something happened <laughs> with the breakout rooms. They they started closing. Just when uh, Magali was uh, giving the most profound. Can I to go me. back to the room? We're, I think time wise we're probably running low on time. <laughs> <laughs> just to remind you, if you if you don't no, no, have no, your no, mic no, on no, mute, no, if you just put your no, mic on mute because no, I think we can pick up quite a lot of background noise. Thanks very much. Is uh, it just one group that's come back here, or has everyone come back here? No, it seems that all the groups are. Seems back. like it's like two groups or so. so no, the the whole thing is closed for some reason. I'm trying to reopen it. I, I think it's okay. Looking at the timeline. Um, I think it's okay. Um, I think everyone would have liked a lot longer in the groups. Um, I think for our group, we could have gone on for nearly an hour uh, speaking about the topic. Um, okay, they're open now. Would you like me to close them? Yeah, if you yeah close the groups now, and I think we will get the three speakers um, or the three uh, group facilitators to perhaps uh, mention a, a kind of key takeaway from their discussions and perhaps some steps going forward that the cluster can take on to uh, perhaps uh, improve things. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, James for, for your group, group one. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, definitely, I think, uh, ended uh, a bit short and we could have uh, discussed further. And I, I hope that's something we can take beyond this week. Um, uh, for those in, interested in, in, in the vulnerability index, uh, the one thing I was was answering um, through a Mentimeter was um, who would be interested in doing a vulnerability uh, index this year, um, uh, who has already maybe implemented one in this last year, and and a lot of the participants were were very much interested, uh, or perhaps interested, in, um, but uh, no one had actually uh, conducted one out of the group. Um, which I think is, is interesting and, and, and a potential for us to, I think, uh, to explore moving forward. And then the, the other component that I was highlighting was um, uh, the importance of, of the, uh, the equation itself in terms of the calculation and how it can be a bit, a bit confusing on how to, to do the composite indicator, indicator index, but, but that once you have the foundations, um, it's quite uh, uh, it's quite flexible. And then in terms of flexibility is that this is just a vulnerability index that can be applied to what, right? To COVID-19, uh, vulnerability to, to, to flooding, to just CCCM as a, as a sector or lens in general, I think is also interesting and tying back into the last slide of my presentation is, is can we actually utilize this understanding of, of vulnerability um, and the indicators from the CCCM or camp management sector, um, camp management minimum standards to, to be able to, to conduct such a vulnerability index across camps and sites to highlight um, these different uh, components of vulnerability uh, related to those standards. But uh, yes, unfortunately, not many uh, detailed discussions or feedback from the participants in the time, but 
uh, hope that we get another opportunity. Uh, back over to you, Brian. Thanks, James. Um, Gretchen, a quick word from you on your session and risky also, if you want. Um, sorry, I'm, uh, my camera is, my camera doesn't work anymore. Ah, no, it works. Uh, we just, we just started discussions. Um, I think we spend a minute to go through some of the details of the um, um, DTM and Partners Toolkit that we will share, you know, the presentation and uh, also contact in terms of uh, a more longer discussion to, to, to go in depth, in, in depth more on that. Uh, the interesting part was actually just now where we, I guess we don't have time to continue the discussion, but at least two big questions came up uh, in the group. Uh, is about um, how can we validate data in hard to reach and inaccessible area? This, this came from Sudan. Uh, and uh, the second one is about how from can Yemen, we coordinate from Yemen. Uh, from Yemen. My apology. Um, uh, the second question was about how we can coordinate better on data collection. Uh, to avoid redundancy, duplication, and uh, fatigue, assessment fatigue, and so on. Um, we didn't manage to discuss this because uh, um, I got uh, pulled out, I think, a few times. But I think, um, I mean, just maybe, maybe that's that's there. Like that, these are the the two questions that came out. We managed to get step one, the asking the questions. Perhaps the, the next stage is the, the answers part. Um, and finally, Magali, um, from your perspective in, in your group, what were your key takeaways and possible actions in the future? Uh, key takeaways, uh, two things. Uh, first, thank you for the questions. That was quite interesting for me to, to hear some of feedback. Um, to understand better uh, the specificities of CCCM as a cluster in terms of data management, uh, more oriented toward community and service um, um, uh, delivery, uh, and how that has challenges uh, also in terms of uh, availability of data uh, in a world that is all about measuring. Um, so I, I, uh, I was very interested to hear more about the request to have um, more consideration for qualitative approaches. And uh, this is uh, yeah, what I was just talking uh, about when we uh, got uh, beamed back into the plenary. Um, the BF is currently um, going through the process of an independent review, which is uh, being conducted by Yale University. And um, one of the um, elements on which the, the independent review is going to be focused is um, to provide more guidance on how to elicit early seat um, expert judgment and how to better integrate quality, qualitative data into the framework uh, and into the uh, the joint uh, intersectoral analysis process itself. So that's um, yeah. The, the GF is in many aspects inspired by the IPC, but this is perhaps one of the elements that hasn't fully been um, constructed to its potential yet. So I'm very happy to uh, to engage more with the CCCM cluster on the, on this element. Thank you. Thanks, Magali. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, insightful comments and feedback in both the, the chat and the discussion room. So I think it'll take uh, Elisa and I a little bit of time to kind of dig through some of that. And I think we really need to incorporate it into our um, uh, IM plans over the next while and um, yeah, really fit it into the strategy discussion that was, uh, that was brought up yesterday. Um, Elisa, what have been your, some of your main takeaways from the session before we close? 
Uh, well, I do believe that a lot of questions that have been raised have been very valid. It was both raised in the main group, of, for example, Elena, when she was asking about waiting. Um, and they're all interrelated between the three sessions somehow, uh, between the GF, um, BTM toolkit, and then reach vulnerability indices, because they're all linking to each other one way or another. And where do we as CCCM stand in that sense? Um, that's a question that I keep asking myself, and I'm still looking for an answer, to be honest, so we will continue looking for that. Um, I'm very sorry that the breakout rooms got cut short, um, I guess, some tech glitch on our side. Uh, but I do think the discussion has been quite interesting, and we're already running over time. It seems that the topic is so hot topic that we should have had more time for that for maybe next year in the next annual retreat our coordinators will give us maybe three slots on there <laughs>